my name is Andrei Terentiev. I am one of the few Russians who had a long time experience with uh, Tibetan people. And I was particularly lucky because I was a kind of personal translator for His Holiness the Dalai Lama in all his visits to Russia and uh, in some visits of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to other countries like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Therefore, Faktorla, the director of the Tibetan Library, asked me to share my memories and experiences about it, and that's why I'm here. Russia was not Russia at that time, it was Soviet Union, and Soviet Union was a difficult country to live in. Uh, because it was totally hostile to any religions. And uh, if somebody knew you are a religious person, you can lose your job, uh, you, you'd better keep it secret. So when I became interested in uh, Buddhism, uh, I didn't proclaim it loudly. Uh, me and uh, my friends practiced in silence. It was like a Buddhist underground in Russia. And when I was 30 years old, I understood that just reading books about Buddhism cannot change your mind. And my friends advised me that in order to practice Buddhism properly, you should have a guru, have a teacher. And by that time, I knew already that Tibetan Buddhism was spread in Russia, and some remains of it were there in three areas of Buryatia, Kalmykia, and Tuva. So I went to Buryatia and traveling for a month in different places, at least at last found a lama who became my, my teacher. This was Jimba Jamtso. Next year, when I came to him again for three months, the good news came that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is arriving to the Soviet Union for the first time in history. It was 1979. And my teacher's family and me, we all went to Ulan-Ude, where I was the only Buddhist monastery of that time, Ivalginsky Datsan, where the meeting with Dalai Lama was planned. In May of 1979, I saw the Dalai Lama for the first time. And you can't believe the impressions which I had. I was working at the Museum of History of Religions and Atheism in St. Petersburg by that time. And I had a paper that museum has sent me to Buryatia to collect materials about Buddhism. So I had some background, some permission to present there, because otherwise all the people who came were just ordinary Buryats. There were almost no Russians or people of other parts of our country. And we were brought to sit waiting for the Dalai Lama at the central uh, place of the monastery before the building of the monastery. Maybe around 500 people waiting for the Dalai Lama for four hours under the sun and like that. The police took me four times from the crown to check my documents and to write down who I am. <laughs> And then finally the Dalai Lama arrived. Uh, he was going with the head party leaders of Buryatia because they were the real uh, hosts of the whole event. And it was a very interesting impression because uh, you don't know how communist leaders look like. They are all very important, like statues going, showing that they are great and you all are small. 
And now these leaders going with the Dalai Lama became small. <laughs> and the Dalai Lama was going like a free person, the only real person among these few uh, communist leaders. And they were shy. They didn't know how to behave. And it was very clear that they feel very uncomfortable to being together with a real person. A very interesting impression. And the Dalai Lama, when he started to talk, uh, uh, his voice was very loud and great. And you felt that he was not afraid of anything. It was fe fearless. And we all felt really happy to see that the real Buddhism is still existing in this world, in, in the face of the Dalai Lama. So His Holiness gave a short talk, and then he uh, gave long for a few major mantras, and also a short generic uh, transmission. Then everybody could come for the blessing. So there was a long queue of Buryats, and I was standing also nearby looking uh, at what, 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 how blessings are given, because I've never seen it. But uh, nearby the responsible communist persons who were responsible for religions were there, and photographer. So I myself didn't dare to come for the blessings because I would lose my job in the museum immediately. But I watched the whole ceremony. And also I have uh, made uh, some photographs and recordings which were forbidden. I was very much afraid that on the way back they will take my uh, tapes and photographs. So we, with my friend, made a long way around the road through the forest to avoid these police posts and f brought this uh, record safely to the city of Olonade. This was my first encounter with the Dalai Lama. After some 10 years, um, when Gorbachev came and uh, the so-called reconstruction of country began, we felt some freedom. And we, uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, had a Buddhist temple, actually, which was built in 1914 by Ngawan Darji, who was an aide to the 13th Dalai Lama. So we claimed for this temple, you know, because it was uh, Gorbachev announced that now you have religious freedom. And according to the current legislation, uh, if you register a religious society, you can claim for, for the building of the temple. After a year, with some difficulties, uh, the Buddhist society, which we organized in St. Petersburg, was given the temple the huge building, four stories of stones. We immediately wrote a letter to His Holiness the Dalai Lama asking advice. What should we do now? So what would be the rules for this temple? What, how, we should, how should we organize the life of the temple and like that? And in 19... 89, His Holiness sent the delegation of three important lama. This was Dinmalachur Rinpoche with his aid, then Kutenla, Nechum Kutenla, also with his helper, uh, and Kantrul Rinpoche uh, from Nigma side. You know, the Kantrul Rinpoche who visited Chambala. So we were extremely happy to receive 
this delegation in St. Petersburg. And after uh, some uh, discussion, they all made blessings to the temple and uh, started some purification ceremonies. While uh, the first purification ceremonies for the temple was given already a year ago by Kushok Bakula Rinpoche, who read the first open Buddhist teaching in post-communist Russia. So we all are very grateful to Kushok Bakula Rinpoche for his help. I managed to receive the possibility to visit Dharamsala. It was also a very difficult procedure because in the Soviet Union, you were not allowed to leave the country. You should have received an outgoing visa in your passport, and nobody could get it. But Kushok Bakula Rinpoche sent me a personal invitation, which disappeared miraculously. Actually, he sent me three invitations, and the third invitation worked, and me and my wife, we traveled to Dharamsala. It was uh, the end of 1989. So we were among the first three or four Russians who came to India uh, for free, not, not, not like a tourist, but for some time. And because the rules in Russia at that time were very strict, we couldn't bring any money. We smuggled only $100, and we were going to stay for six months with that. So the Tibetan community supported us very much. Because I had established some contacts with the Tibetan community earlier. For a long time, I had a letter communication with Tibetan library. And the head of Tibetan library, Gyatso uh, Tseringla, very warm person. Uh, we made book exchange. And when we came, he gave us a, book to, a room to stay for free for six months. And we were very friendly. We attended the courses in, in the library of this time and uh, had established wonderful friendship relations with the staff of the library. Then uh, we were working in, while in Russia. Before that, I was also working as translator, not only to Bakula Rinpoche, but also some Tibetan uh, top officials were visiting Soviet Union. Uh, it was Lodi Gyari Rinpoche, the head of an international office. And, uh, and after a while, when we settled here, we were given the opportunity to have audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We were very much excited. Uh, to be able to meet the Dalai Lama in person and talk to him. But there was some misunderstanding uh, because the audience was fixed on one day. But the day before, somebody from the private office called us by phone uh, and said, why are you not here? We are waiting for you. We were terribly excited and ran quickly to uphill and forgot the heater in the glass of water in our room in the library. <laughs> when we recollected it, we decided, let it be, we have the audience. <laughs> they shouldn't, fortunately, there were no, no fire, everything finished very good. Uh, when we uh, entered the room of His Holiness, and I wanted to make prostration. He stopped me. He caught my head and said on the pure Russian language, 
Здравствуйте, очень хорошо. It means hello, very good. I was totally surprised to hear the Dalai Lama speaking in Russian. And he laughed about it and explained that he learned some Russian words while he was sitting at the Communist Party Congress in China. There was a Russian ambassador sitting nearby. They both didn't know Chinese and talked among themselves, so he learned some Russian from him, <laughs> not wasting time. His colleagues is always using time for getting more information and education. It was a very wonderful and exciting talk, and we also discussed about the Buddhist temple of St. Petersburg, also our personal interest. And I'll be, I shall mention some things which may, may be not very standard, but I'm, maybe it's interesting for Tibetans to hear it from me. For example, when we talked about the St. Petersburg Temple, His Holiness said, of course, that's our temple. Actually, the certain Dalai Lama donated a lot of money uh, for building this temple. And when we asked, what should we do now with this temple? Could you help us in some way or other? The Dalai Lama said, you know, if I were able to, I would set four lamas from main four Tibetan traditions. But practically, it's not possible. <laughs> Because the traditions are not that friendly, they cannot they'll be quarreling about the uh, rituals and like that. I was very much surprised. We had an impression that His Holiness has complete command over the Tibetan Buddhism, <laughs> but it was not like that. Anyway, uh, he uh, said that, of course, we shall help you. We shall present you the whole set of Tibetan canon, kangyur, and uh, we'll send sculptors to make a main statue for the altar and like that. It was a very exciting talk and very exciting experience. After studying for six months here at the library, uh, that time I was working on editing the Russian translation of Lamrim Chanmo, which we prepared by that time. And my wife mainly studied spoken Tibetan language. Unfortunately, I had no opportunity because to share my time into these two areas I was working on editing. When we were leaving, we learned that Soon, His Holiness the Dalai Lama may visit Russia openly and officially, because when he visited in 1979, later he also visited 1984, when he visited St. Petersburg. These were the visits which were not covered in press. They like secret visits. And now he, he was invited to visit the uh, Soviet Union openly. And he said, is it true that you have freedom of religion now? I said, yes, it's true. The Dalai Lama said, I don't believe you. <laughs> And he said, when I came in 1979, you know, it was a strange situation. In Moscow, there was so dark atmosphere that for a few days I could not make my practice properly. I had no concentration. Then I overcame, but still it was a very strange impression. I said, yes, please come and see for yourself. And then when the visit was being organized, 
I was told that I was chosen to be the personal translator for His Holiness from English language into Russian because I didn't know spoken Tibetan language. And these two years, 1991-92, two visits of His Holiness, this was the top time of my life, the peak of my life, because he, the Dalai Lama traveled over Russia almost a month, one, 1991 and almost a month, 1992. And I was following him everywhere. I was to sit with him in the car. I was to sit by him in the plane because he, he may, might need some, something and I should translate it into Russian. And it was an unbelievable experience and unbelievable opportunity for me uh, to know the personality of uh, the Dalai Lama. Uh, first, uh, when he came, I took a small tape recorder with me and uh, I was going to properly record whatever possible and to write in my notebook, but it was not possible because I was translated from morning till night, not only for the Dalai Lama, but for the whole retinue, because there were many questions to be solved about food, about transport, about lodging, many, many things, and I was doing all this job with, for, for the whole team of the Dalai Lama. And the first meetings were uh, in Moscow, then we traveled to Buryatia and, uh, and to Kalmykia in the first year. The happiness of people who saw the Dalai Lama was unbelievable. There were crowds and I was very much afraid for his security because thousands of people were moving to and fro and police couldn't do anything. So only when they placed the Dalai Lama in the car, it was a safe um, place. But uh, not only his big speeches and uh, initiations of Alakiteshvara, which he gave in Buryatia and Kalmykia, were important. Also, lots of private interviews. And you know, there were different people coming out saying different things. So the Dalai Lama often asked my comments on what's going on. And you see, I was in quite a unique situation uh, in this respect. Because on one side, I was working at the Museum of History of Religion and Atheism. It was official government institution, the leading place for the scientific atheism and criticism of religion. So I knew whatever was going on in the country from this side. From the other side, I was a member of the Buddhist underground. So I knew the opposite side. And generally, I had a doctorship from St. Petersburg University. So I knew the literature, I knew what was going on and many other things. So. In most cases, I could uh, help a little bit to His Holiness to realize where this person who he was talking to is saying proper thing or it's not quite exact. When I was translating for His Holiness, I could do it in, in different way. When I saw that the person is saying good, true things, I was internally uh, translating with emotion and trying to uh, pass the whole meaning of his speech to His Holiness. When there was some party leader or a person who is a little bit crazy or, or something like that, I was translating mechanically, just without emotion, and so His Holiness could understand that I do not share the view. <laughs> So there were many subtleties in this respect. And different people come, were coming to see him. 
One claimed that he is a relative of the Russian Tsar, and now he is organizing the Russian Empire. Uh, so he was brought, so he asked some advice. One person who wanted to, me to help him to talk to the Dalai Lama said that he is uh, Jesus Christ who came for the second time. And you know, I, I am not a saint. I cannot judge uh, whether he is crazy or whatever. So I said to the, to the Dalai Lama that there is a person who is claiming that he is Jesus Christ uh, and he needs your help. His holiness didn't respond. And later he said that if he really were Jesus Christ, that he could help me, not me could help him. <laughs> and uh, so in, in some cases, his silence was the answer uh, to the questions of people. Uh, then there was interesting experience because when His Holiness was coming to uh, communist uh, party institution for them, for example, to the parliament of Kalmyk Republic. Uh, he was received in Kalmyk on the top level. And it was uh, just unbelievable like people reacted. You know, in Kalmyk, when the air airplane landed, he was, the Dalai Lama was taken straight to the stadium where about 20,000 people were waiting for him. And the carpet was from the airplane to the, uh, from, not from, from his car, he was brought into the car to the stadium for maybe around 200 meters. Whatever step he made, the roses were thrown to his feet. So he was, and me too, because I was going by, we worked on the roses. Uh, just unbelievable. And uh, when later he talked to the Kalmyk parliament, first, uh, you know, people felt very shy. They didn't know how could they speak to such a person like the Dalai Lama. Uh, but he uh, very clever asked, um, what are about your harvest in this year in your republic? What about your cattle breeding? So he gave some uh, questions which made them uh, to land on the reality. And they felt easier. And the talk was very interesting. And by that time, you know, the Chinese government we were sending special uh, notes uh, to the Foreign Office uh, of Soviet Union, to Kalmykia, and to Buryatia. But on this sitting of parliament, uh, the chairman just read loudly this Chinese note, and people were laughing at each phrase. And they, they just threw it away. <laughs> the country was free, and the whole situation was just wonderful freedom. Because after the communist time, we felt the air of freedom for the, at last. So we were not afraid. Unbelievable. Uh, also, uh, it was interesting to uh, know that in the private interviews I can mention that the ministers of police and of KGB, that is secret police, uh, also asked an audience with His Holiness and they confessed for the untrue things which we were doing. I was translating, you know. <laughs> So they too confessed because that they were mis mistreating Buddhism and were doing wrong things in their life. So his holiness said, 
Of course, the situation was difficult. It's nice that you confess what we were doing. Okay, so they could go. But the minister of KGB, he was 100% sure that I'm also a member of KGB. Because as a translator of the Dalai Lama, KGB is everywhere. They were thought that I was placed there with the help of KGB. And he, when I was walking around the capital of Elista, he sent a special security with me that <laughs> he would take care of and like that. His Holiness made wonderful teaching there on the three roots of the path, including Prajna Paramita. And I was uh, translating from the English translating of Thaktor La. Thaktor La was sitting by the His Holiness and translating simultaneously into English, and I was translating from the English language into the Russian language. So Kalmykia was a wonderful experience. Then uh, in Buryatia at that time uh, also there was a huge stadium with thousands of people where the Dalai Lama gave teaching. But that teaching was translated by someone. Buryat invited another translator from Moscow and we were just standing nearby, helping him sometimes when he didn't know terminology. There, uh, the Buryat Lamas showed to His Holiness the new institution for education, which they just established. Uh, we visited this uh, institution. Uh, the Dalai Lama blessed it because he always was stressing the importance of education in Buddhism. Also, in Buryatia, he tried uh, to improve the Dulva, Vinaya, because in Mongolian areas, there is a problem that some people who wear monk robes are not monks in reality. They, uh, on daytime, they go to the temple, and uh, at night, they go to their families uh, and their homes. So His Holiness strongly commented that if you are layman, you should not wear monk robes. Also, uh, he visited many places where there were the ruins of dis destroyed monasteries, because in Buryatia, there were about 40 big monasteries, which most of them were ruined, and some were a little bit uh, restored and reopened by that time. So in particular, he visited Gusinazersky Datsan, which was the head monastery of Buryatia. And also he gave um, a lecture uh, at university in ulan the capital of Buryat Republic. I was translating this uh, lecture, and at, then the students were allowed to ask questions. And uh, the last questions were about reincarnation. So His, His Holiness was quite excited and to answer these questions. He was he liked that students are so interested in important thing, things. And then when we came to the car and drove to a residence, which was some distance from the city, His Holiness asked me, there was interesting talk I want to tell. He asked me, and you, Andre, uh, did you have do you difficulty with believing in reincarnation? I answered that when I was starting to study Buddhism, I had difficulty with to believe in reincarnation. 
But finally, I decided that whether incarn uh, incarnation exists or it doesn't exist, there is no better philosophy than Buddhist philosophy uh, with compassion and wisdom on the first plane. And His Holiness said, right, I also think so. He said that some people would not agree with me, but I uh, have such uh, consideration. Uh, have, uh, see, for example, we have uh, four major Buddhist philosophical schools, like true lower and true higher. And we consider that uh, to reach the Buddhahood, you can only with Prasanga Kamathyamaka. But if you can look at Sautrantika or Vaibhashika, these schools do not have uh, this developed view of emptiness which uh, we have in higher schools. So the difference between uh, the views of these schools and Madhyamika Prasangika is far more important than, than difficult than the question about the existence of reincarnation. Because if reincarnation exists or not, that's a problem of a relative truth level. And when we talk about the emptiness, we come about the real reality level. The difference is far more important. But nobody can say that Vaibhashik and Sautrantik are not Buddhist. Therefore, I think that you can be Buddhist not believing in reincarnation. He said, many people wouldn't agree with me, but that's my view. I was very much impressed uh, with this and uh, remember details of this talk up to now. Also, in Buryatia there were many other meetings uh, his Holiness talked to the people in the theater and there was a telephone call that you have a bomb in the theater. So we were to evacuate His Holiness from the hall. Many other interesting uh, things happened. And the, ne the next year His Holiness visited Russia again uh, at the end of summer. Uh, actually, his visit was planned to the beginning of summer, but the political situation in the Soviet Union was, became dangerous. And uh, I wrote a letter and found that it's better to postpone visit and it was correct because we had a cope, military cope. So the communists tried to put the country on the old rails. The cope was lost, but uh, tanks were in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and uh, there were some clashes, some people died. And His Holiness came after that. He was very happy uh, to see that the uh, that people were, were not doing uh, the military resistance, but it was peaceful resistance to the cope. They were. They came with flowers to tanks and put flowers in the tanks. And His Holiness especially came to the place where three persons uh, died, were killed by the tank, and placed kata there. Also, he, he wanted to visit... Uh, there was, you know, in the Soviet Union, there was a very famous Russian dissident thinker, Andrei Sakharov. He was an academician, he was the, was the author of the Russian nuclear weapon. Then he became the 
main fighter for human rights. He was persecuted also in Russia, exiled from Moscow to some other place. But when uh, the Soviet Union fell apart, he was elected into the parliament. But unfortunately, very soon he died because he was elderly person already. So His Holiness uh, was very fond of his activities. And uh, we came to visit the widow of uh, Sakharov, uh, who lived in Moscow, Elena Bonner. When we were in the elevator going to her, His Holiness said, oh, I forgot the kata. He said, do you have kata? I had a kata. He said, can Dalai Lama borrow kata from you? <laughs> I took my kata, but he said, oh, that's a small one. It wouldn't fit. And send somebody to bring a good kata. Uh, so uh, he, he, in memory of uh, Sakharov, the great fighter for human rights in the Soviet Union, uh, he gave this kata to his widow. We had a teaser, and she presented him the, his works published already. And we left. Then, during the second visit in 1992, he, for the first time, visited not, not only Buryatia and Kalmykia, but also Tuva Republic. This is the third place of ethnic Buddhism in Russia. And they were four miles from the airport to the capital country, to the capital of the <coughs> republic. And you can imagine that the, on the four miles, people were standing on the knees, uh, greeting the car with His Holiness, because they uh, were robbed of religion. Uh, by that time, all the lamas were dead already, and on, only one elderly person, former monk, was brought to see the Dalai Lama, one, the last one who was there. In Tuva, the Dalai Lama also spoke at the big square to, uh, to the people, and it, this was also a dangerous place because the, the crowd was not controllable. And also we came to see the place uh, of the biggest monastery of Tuva, which was totally destroyed, but some remains of walls, these thick walls made of clay, were still there. And when the, it was, we went by helicopter, and when the helicopter was approaching, the Dalai Lama had some vision. I was sitting by him, so he told me that, you know, I hear the monk reciting the Diamond Sutra. When we landed, we were taken to the local, a kind of local museum of Buddhism, because they didn't have temples, they had just a sort of museum with remains. And the first thing which was given to the Dalai Lama was Diamond Sutra. And he said, showed me, <laughs> see. Tuva had the worst experience under the communism, totally destroyed. And I, when I tried to find out how it happened, because Tuva was virtually independent, and I was told that the Buddhism was destroyed not by Russians, but by Tuvinians themselves. Some lamas were rich and were hated by people, and the young people who were victims of communist propaganda 
destroyed it uh, by themselves. But of course, many Lamas were arrested and sent to the concentration camps into the Soviet uh, Union. I visited the war before that several times. I was asked to take part in making the catalog of Tibetan wood blocks and manuscripts in local museum. For two or three, three years I worked there. And I was fortunate to see two last educated lamas who were there. But when his colonists came, they were not there already, unfortunately. And uh, in 1992, it also happened that the Dalai Lama went to Buryatia and visited not only uh, Buryatia, but also the autonomous area of Buryatia, which is nearby. Uh, you know, during the Soviet Union, Buryatia was divided into parts in a similar way like Tibet was divided into parts under Chinese communists. Chinese followed our example. So why one big area near the city of Chita to the east uh, was cut of Buryatia and called the Buryat Autonomous uh, Area. So the, but it had the biggest monasteries with about 1,000 monks in each. Aginsky Datsan and Tsugulsky Datsan. And my teacher was, uh, at that time, he became an abbot of Tsugulsky Datsan, which was to be restored. And I was most happy when we landed uh, uh, near the monastery with the Dalai Lama. And the old lamas of this monastery, whom were my good friends and my teacher, and I was coming with the Dalai Lama to introduce them. It was also a so unbelievably happy moment. The Dalai Lama stayed there for a week, and he also visited the main pilgrimage place in Buryatia. There was uh, some mountains, and forest, and there one mountain called Alkanai. For uh, the more than 100 of years, it was considered a hidden land of Denchok. And there were many springs, some chortens. The main chorten was blown up by communists three times, but believers rebuilt it again in the forest, they couldn't be caught. So we came that time, and I was instructed by my teacher what to tell to His Holiness about the sacred places of this area. So I was like a guide on my own country. I, I was also very happy at that time to show it to me. Walking in the forest was also very interesting with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> For example, uh, he said that the, there was some worm on the tree. He said, you know, I'm a little bit afraid of worms. <laughs> Maybe uh, it has something with my karma. <laughs> so, and such things. There he was making a big purification of land ritual. Uh, we all read some text, and this was very important. Uh, later, when he stayed uh, in the Aginsky area, he also saw the exploded Chorten, which was the biggest Chorten in Buryatia, I think, but only the hill was there. So it was very sad for His Holiness to see this hill, and I told him the story about it. But after 10 years, uh, this Chorten was restored and rebuilt. Uh, so when I came to Dharamsala later, I was happy to show it. 
to his holiness, he was very happy to see that uh, it's going on, the restoration of Dharma in Soviet Union. But when he was there, what he saw with his own eyes was, was the results of total destruction. Therefore, I was very much surprised when after a year, 1993, <clears throat> I read that in some interview in Canada, uh, His Holiness said that he believes that Russia will become one of strongholds of Buddhism. After all the, this picture of total destruction, how could it be? Next year, he again came to Moscow, the Dalai Lama, and asked him, did you really say that? He said, yes, I think so. I think that you have a good future for Buddhism. I was very much encouraged by his world. Also, uh, when he came here, no, it was 1991 when he came, he also recommended me that you should make a Buddhist journal in Russian. And we organized the first Buddhist journal and Buddhist publishing house. Buddhist publishing house was called Nartang because actually it, it was a branch of Nartang publications of international office with Lodi Gyari like a branch, because otherwise you couldn't register a publishing house in Russia at that time. The communist legislation didn't give any possibility to, to publish. So we pretended we were a branch of Tibetan publishing house, and we started, and we published the first book in Russian of the Dalai Lama called Buddhism of Tibet, where we collected not only his famous uh, short text on books of his Tibet, but also his Nobel Prize talk and something other. At that time, before we didn't have any Buddhist literature in Russia during the Soviet time. And this we published again with the help of Tibetans, because Tibetans gave us the paper. There was no paper to publish on. Lodi Gyari gave us the paper, and we borrowed some money, for, I don't remember where, uh, and we published 80,000 copies. So this book was sold immediately. Uh, also, uh, in Russia by that time, we first heard, many people heard the talks about the Tibetan, the Tibetan situation. When Lodi Gyari came uh, to St. Petersburg in 1989, we, for the first time we came with Tibetan flag into the big democratic meeting and people were asking, what is, the, what is this flag, what it means? And uh, we explained about the Tibet situation. Oh, but I think I talked too long about the first questions, <laughs> about the visits of His Holiness. Later, after the visit of 1994, uh, it became difficult for him to visit because of Chinese pressure. The Chinese pressure became stronger and the Russian government was, not, uh, was reluctant to allow the visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And there was only one exception in 2003 when he came to consecrate the main temple in Kalmykia. He came just for two days. The, since that time, we only are praying and asking that His Holiness should come. At the end of 1990, I even applied to court against the government that they don't give visa to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. But the court said, please show us the document that we rejected. 
but they were just oral negotiations, no documents, so we couldn't do anything. But people still have hope because many thousands of believers, I think we have from 500,000 to 1 million of Buddhist believers all over the Russian, including not only Buddhist areas, ethnic Buddhist areas, but also Russians in other places. Not, not so many people have money to travel to India or to other places to see His Holiness. So it's, it would be very fortunate, very important for them if someday His Holiness could visit, of course. Concerning the problem how I became Buddhist, it's uh, not a very usual story, maybe. You know, uh, when I was young, I had deep interest about the nature of the world. Because I felt that something is wrong in the Soviet Union, but I couldn't understand what is wrong. And I went to study philosophy. And the great Lenin recommended that you should study the whole uh, human culture in order to be a good communist. I was not communist, but I valued communist ideas more than anything else. I was brought up like that. So I followed this advice this wise advice, and I wanted to study the whole history of philosophy. And in the history of philosophy, the best philosophy which I was able to find was Buddhist philosophy. In fact, we had a very short lecture on Indian philosophy at all, but I was able to organize that we had a Student Research Society, and I organized a section on Oriental philosophy. And in this, in this section of Oriental philosophy, we collected some people from different sites who had some knowledge of Indian philosophy, of Buddhist philosophy, of Chinese philosophy. And there, uh, I had some more acquaintance of Buddhist philosophy. Also, we read some books and became more, more acquainted. And when I read about Mathematical philosophy, I felt that I have found the thing which I was looking for all my life, because I think this is flawless. This is the right philosophy, I should follow this. And I start, started to study Buddhist philosophy. Uh, after several years, I was also uh, acquainted with Bodhisattva doctrine. This was another very important for me person moment for me personally, because by that time, in this uh, section of in Oriental philosophy, some people were doing yoga. I also studied yoga, I studied Sanskrit. Uh, we also studied Christianity. But I felt a little inconvenient with the idea of finding personal salvation, you know? I think that I am sitting on this cushion, meditating, want to become one with the universe, to save my soul and to reach eternity or whatever. But my parents are working on their plants and bring me some food and take care of me. I feel uncomfortable that I am working just for myself and other people like serving me. But in Bodhisattva doctrine, I, when they say that the best thing is to work for others, I felt this is the right thing. This is what was like fresh air for me. So in, in Buddhism, I found both 
most wise philosophy and the best ethical doctrine, like working for others. I felt that this is directly what I was looking for. And then it happened that I was trying to do some meditations, but nothing came out of it until I went to Buryatia and found the Buddhist teacher. Then when I started uh, to practice under the Buddhist teacher, I felt a great difference compared to what I was doing just by my own. Practicing I have started when I was 30. It was 1978 when I first met my teacher. Then each year I visited. He lived in a small village in Buryatia. And every year I went to his place, received some more teaching, and lived for some time there. And then I practiced in St. Peter's, in Leningrad again. That's how it happened. I thought that from my own experience, that when I became interested in Buddhism, the main problem was there was no literature in the Russian language, practically. Maybe one or two small books. So the people who were interested in Buddhism didn't know what to do, what Buddhism means. And uh, even before, in, in the 80s, we started to translate the great Tibetan classic Lam Rim Chan Mo. First we had some group, because it, for one person it was too difficult. Then uh, finally there remained only two persons. Uh, my friend from Lithuania, Algirdas Kugavichus, and me. But we have very different styles. Uh, and finally we decided that Algirdas is doing main translation and I am doing editing because I was more educated and read more literature in Russian and my Russian language was better. So uh, these functions were decisive on the last stage, not on the first stage. <laughs> so together with him, first we made the Lam Rim Chin Mu. When I came to Dharamsala for the first time for six months in 1990, was my main task, as I mentioned already, was to edit. We had three first volumes uh, ready already. And uh, I was going to different geshes and lamas around asking uh, to explain me this or that place in Lambrim. Uh, later, fortunately, I was able uh, in 1990 Eight, to attend a great course on Hakton section of Lam Rim Chin Mu, which was given by Geshe Sopa, Geshe Lindup Sopa, who lived in the United States. Because Hakton I couldn't edit without proper teaching. And this teaching was for three months, six hours a day, with one on Sunday, one day rest. This was decisive. By that time, we have published first four volumes of Lam Rim already. And after this course, I have edited the last sections on Slag Tong. And in 2000, uh, we have published uh, the first European translation of Lam Rim Chin Mo, earlier than Americans. <laughs> This was the main thing, I think. Uh, then, after two decades, we published a number of other works. Uh, we published Lamrim Dring, the mid middle length Lamrim. We published the Ngagrim Chenmo in three volumes. As far as I know, there is still no English translation, only Russian translation. We published 
the autobiography of Kirtisan Shaprim Pache, which is existed only in Tibetan and in Russian translation. We published some classics by Maitreya Asanga, the Uttara Tantra, uh, and other texts from five great doctrines of Asanga and Maitreya. But most important of this, the Abhisamaya Alankara was published not by us, but Raisa Krapivina, uh, one Tibetologist in Russia, very good Tibetologist. It was published with the help of Gomang Gishe Jamyan Kintse, who stayed in St. Petersburg for 15 years, uh, teaching different things. And for five years, he was teaching the Abhisamaya Lankara, Prajna Parameter. After that, uh, Raisa has published the Russian translation, together with commentaries of Gishe, five volumes also. Of course, we published several things uh, which were written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, the first was the freedom in exile, then my land and my people, then ethics for the new millennium. And I also can tell you one thing. I don't know whether you will broadcast it or not. For example, when uh, I was translating the, my land and my people, there is some section on emptiness. And the text was a little bit strange. I couldn't believe what His Holiness wanted to say. And uh, fortunately, I had opportunity to ask himself about it. It was around 2000. I said, Your Holiness, you, you have written this thing. Could you please comment? I don't understand. He was silent for a while. And then he said, you know, when this book was ready and given to me the English translation of this book, I have made many notes, many corrections uh, with a red pencil and like that throughout the whole book. But when they printed, I saw that nothing was included. I was very much disappointed. So this happens everywhere, of course, and this is so good book, so important book. I am sure that later the Tibetan editorial team improved and made better work. When we gain, uh, gained freedom of religion around 1990, immediately there sprang many Buddhist organizations because people felt they can do anything. Uh, for example, in St. Petersburg, we had more than 10 Buddhist centers belonging to different traditions, not only of Tibetan, but also Vietnamese, Japanese, and, and other. But after some 10 years, some centers disappeared, some joined together. And now there are fewer centers. For instance, in St. Petersburg, there are three or four, but they are bigger and more, more established. And the process is going on in many, many cities of Russia outside of traditional religion. But how many Russians are there? It's difficult to say. I don't think that not too much, in fact. While in traditional areas like Buryatia, Kalmykia, and Tuva, you definitely have hundreds of believers. And as in other countries, 
we had a slight difference between ethnic Buddhism and the new Buddhists. Because for ethnic Buddhism in Buryatia, Kalmyk and Tuva, Buddhism is a part of national culture. And they pay more attention to the rituals, to external things, to traditions, uh, how you're doing korva, uh, where you put uh, your uh, flags, and how you build stupas and other temples. This is, uh, these visual uh, things are considered to be very important. For example, in Buryatia, I said that they had more than 40 temples. Uh, by 2000, uh, by the year 2000, around 30 of them were partly or completely rebuilt already. But the buildings are ready, but there were no educated monks to sit there. So only then people started to realize that the Buddhism is not buildings. Buddhism is what you, is inside. And since that time, since the first visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, hundreds of Buryats, Kalmyks, Tuvinians, and also some Russians went to India to receive education in Buddhist monasteries, mainly in Goman monasteries. Because traditionally, in the 19th century, they were getting education mainly in Goman. Now also hundreds of Mongolians and hundreds of people from the Russian Federation study there. There are a few Gishes already, even one Haramba Gishe in Russia we have. So generally Buddhism growing. Also now every year dozens of Buddhist books, if not hundreds, are published in the Russian language. Some translations are good, some are made by commercial people. Still it's life, what to do? Concerning our efforts to help the Tibetans in their struggle, we began it from the very beginning, in, I think in 1991. There we organized the first Friends of Tibet Society in St. Petersburg, in or Leningrad, I don't remember how our city was called. It was renamed by that time. First it was called Leningrad during the Soviet time. Then the old name St. Petersburg was returned to it. It was the first uh, Friends of Buddhist Society. In Russia, we decided not to call it Buddhist Support Group, but to call it Friends of Tibet Society to avoid direct political connection. It was easier for us. When we returned from Dharamsala, we started that, because we didn't realize how important it was before we, knew, we have heard of it, but we didn't uh, realize the real importance of this question. And by then, uh, my wife was the first president of this society. We started promoting Tibetan culture. We made uh, festivals of Tibetan culture, uh, maybe twice a year. On the 10th of March, we made demonstrations by the Tibetan embassy, Tibetan consulate and we had in St. Petersburg. It was very successful because Tibetan uh, Chinese were afraid. They called the police, the military police came, the whole band, but they saw so that we have only peaceful slogans like free Tibet and Tibet is not part of China. And because we were peaceful, the police was friendly with us. They didn't, didn't touch us. Then each year we made these demonstrations 
on the 10th of March. And then Chinese were hiding. When we came to the consulate, they would lock all the windows, lock all the doors, and only cameras from above were shooting us. Then, uh, after a few years, the Chinese uh, consul uh, invited my wife and me to a restaurant uh, in the end of February. Not the consul himself, but deputy consul. And they invited us to Chinese restaurant and said, what are you going to do this year? Uh, let's uh, don't do demonstrations, do something different. So they were uh, very much affected by our efforts. Of course, we did demonstration again. But uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, it was useless because Chinese didn't pay attention, but police paid great attention. They wouldn't allow us to approach Chinese consul. They say, you go to the other part of the city, you made demonstrations there. No sense, no Chinese around. First time in 19, I think 95, or later, I don't remember the date. It was a good place. And, but when we came to make demonstrations, there were also many Chinese students who had the opposite demonstration against Tibet. The Tibet is for, was a part of China forever. But the police, that period was on our side, and they started to check documents of Chinese. Do you have a permission to stay in St. Petersburg and like that? So many Chinese ran away. <laughs> but not now, now it's different. Uh, that period also the Chinese uh, consulate once dared to celebrate Tibetan New Year. And they invited the Chinese scholars and our friends of Tibet Society to attend the celebration of Tibetan New Year. And we went. First, they show us the movie how Tibetans and Chinese were fighting British invasion of the end of the 19th century. Then they said rose, there was a big table like in this room with around 50 persons invited and also Chinese diplomats. So they rose the toast for Tibetan New Year and like that. And then I took the next toast and I said that the whole movie was lie because the Tibetan at that time, they asked for Chinese military help and Chinese refused military help and, and told what I wanted to say. All the Chinese scholars and diplomats went out of the table and only the Chinese consul was standing nearby with his glass and translated, who translated to him to the temple. So I was saying whatever I wanted to say about Tibet to him. He was a very good diplomat. He said, thank you very much. Gave me his card. <laughs> and, and then the procedure continued. People continued to, drink, to eat and drink and like that. <laughs> it was a fun. But now useless. Now, now we prefer to make some kind of uh, conferences uh, for press. We invite some press and remind them about the date. But last year, for example, we did it in one press center. But then it happened that for some reasons the broadcasting was cut off. 
So our press conference about Tibet uh, uprising day was not broadcasted. It became more and more difficult. I was uh, also delegate to some international conferences of Tibet support group, and we discussed the situation and we discussed with our Tibetan friends because what to do when you cannot do anything proper <laughs> and Chinese totally ignore us. And we were advised uh, to do whatever possible, just to dissem disseminate information about Tibet, about Tibetan culture, about Tibetan Buddhism, about Tibetan traditions, about the Tibetan political situation, about Tibetan diaspora in the West, everything you know. And that's what we are uh, trying to do. Uh, at every instance, we are trying to, uh, to take more attention to, to the Tibetan culture, Tibetan philosophy. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, also when I visited three or four years ago, also said, when you are making lectures about Tibetan philosophy, please try to make these lectures accessible not only for Buddhists, but just for people who are interested in philosophy, in order they would catch up something of, from Tibetan philosophy. We are not, we do not want that everybody would become Buddhist. We want to share what we know, what we discovered. Also, I, I think our great help, our great uh, deal was that now Russian scientists joined the discussions with Tibetan scholars, Tibetan science, uh, people who are studying hu human consciousness and like that. You know that we had two meetings with Tibetan scientists and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and later three laboratories, Russian laboratories, were organized in the Tibetan monasteries in the south to study the Tukdam event and to study meditation. It attracts a lot of attention press in Russia and uh, attracting attention to Tibetan, Tibetan studies of human mind and it attracts attention to studies of Tibetan Buddhism and of Tibetan issue you know, you know, at all. Uh, so I think this is the most fruitful way in our time to attract attention to Tibetan culture and through that to the Tibetan situation in the whole. In, uh, in the Soviet Union and Russia, when we gained freedom and we were all so hungry for Buddhist wisdom and published a lot of Buddhist texts, it was like explosion. But now when you look around, you don't find so many people who are really interested in a deep Buddhist philosophy. Uh, so when it comes to that you should spend years and years studying different, difficult languages and difficult philosophy, there are not so many people who have enthusiasm. But I think uh, because also there became many other opportunities. Some people go into science, some go into business. Uh, the, the world became opened and uh, the interest to the spirituality was going down a little bit in the Soviet Union. But now situation changes again. Russia closes, becomes a closed country. We practically cannot go outside. The relations with the foreign countries 
become more and more limited. Perhaps it will help Buddhists to develop again inside Russia. I remember we had one Buryat Lama, Dandaron, who used to say that the Soviet Union is the best place to practice Buddhism because uh, uh, lazy people do not go in Buddhism. Those who, who want to make money or to do something can go to make money. But if you go to Buddhism, you have risks, you have difficulties, but then you become hard and you become a hardcore Buddhist. <laughs> So maybe the situation makes more difficult, is getting more difficult in Russia. Maybe it will have some positive results for us. But generally, if we are speaking for the whole world, I think there is no need to give any advice because Buddhist philosophy, I really think that it is the deepest philosophers out of existing philosophies of the West. It's, we had many discussions about that. For example, two years ago, we had a special conference on phenomenology in the Institute of Philosophy of Academy of Sciences of Russia. We invited several best phenomenologists from United States and from other uh, countries and discussed with them. Gisha Jinpa also was, Tupten Jinpa was also there. And I'm getting more and more sure that Buddhist philosophy is just as comparable. It's, and it will become more and more important because clever people do understand it little by little the more they know about Buddhist philosophy, they use it more and more. Not only philosophers, but also, say, in quantum mechanics and in psychology of human brain. The Buddhist has ideas and experiences which are far beyond the contemporary science in the field of philosophy and in understanding the nature of things. Therefore, if we want it or not, the Buddhist ideas will spread around the world. We can only assist it. I think I said what I could about the Tibetan culture and Tibetan philosophy and its importance. Uh, I told what I could about my happy meetings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His birthday we celebrate every year. At this time I was happy to be in Dharamsala at that time. And I think that Tibetan people and Tibetan culture would be more and more appreciated in the whole world. And finally, you will regain your freedom in this or that way. But at the same time, I can tell you one more thing. Uh, of course, that uh, everybody is discussing that uh, the Dalai Lama has uh, chosen the middle way, that uh, he agreed that Tibet can stay within the limits of Russia if uh, it has a substantial autonomy. China. Yes. When it first happened, uh, after a couple of years of this, I also had a meeting with His Holiness, and I asked him, Your Holiness, you have chosen this middle way because there is no alternative. He said, no, Andrei, I really think that it would be more positively accepted and it will be more useful 
both for Tibetan and Chinese. Because Tibetan and Chinese people are neighbors. If you live side by side, you cannot get rid of it. And China is highly developed in industries and economics. It will be helpful for Tibetan. Tibet is developed in spirituality. It will be helpful for Chinese. And you know it is helpful for Chinese because there are so many Chinese Buddhists now. And what was done by China to Tibetans, you cannot change it. It was done. And no reason to be, to have hatred in your heart because nothing can be changed already. You should try to develop compassion and love in order to avoid hatred. Therefore, if Ch even if Tibetan stayed on friendly terms with China, it would be good for both uh, nations, for Tibetans in Tibet and for Chinese in China. I think that finally these deep ideas will find their way into reality. And this was that way. That's all I can say.